Good morning, everybody. Hi, um, my name is Khadija. I'm a PhD student in the Family Social Sciences Department here at the University of Minnesota. And I will be introducing your speakers this morning. I do not know the order in, your, in which you're sitting, but when I say your name, just wave to the audience. All right, thank you. Um, we have Dr. Teresa Andrusve, who is a demographer and gerontologist interested in the health and mortality of older adults in the US. Her research broadly focuses on population health and the social determinants of health and mortality. Her current research examines work as a contributing, as a contributor to inequality in health at older ages. And she is also interested in the unequal burden of COVID-19 and its social behavioral determinant. Dr. Teresa. Nice to meet you. I'm just gonna introduce everybody. Um, and then we have Dr. Margaret Courtney. Hi. Margaret and Margaret is an associate professor of sociology and criminolo criminology program chair at the University of Laverne. She co-directs the social determinants of health and health disparities lab at Laverne. Margaret studies social determinants of health and health inequities, family dynamics and labor forces outcomes using data from IPUMS and the National Longitudinal Survey. In the health and retirement study, her work has been supported by an R15 grant from the National Institute on Aging and various small grants. And I have here Dr. Bert Chantrat. Hi. And uh, Dr. Burt is a research scientist at the Center for Anti-Racism Research for Health Equity at the University of Minnesota. Dr. Chantrat earned a PhD in health services, research policy and administration from the University of Minnesota and MPH in epidemiology from Columbia University. Dr. Chantrat bridges theories and methods from sociology, epidemiology and the decision sciences to understand the methods mechanisms that produce and reinforces racial health equities and identify strategies to disrupt them. His current research programs include operationalizing and measuring structural racism using mathematical models such as micro -sim simulation agent-based models to evaluate the cost-effective anti-racist interventions. Um, his research has been published in journals of health Sir health services research, health affairs, health in place, and the American Journal of Epidemiology. All right, Dr. Burt, welcome and thank you for joining us today. And last but not least, we have Grace Van Chalk. I think I hope I said your last name right. Okay. And Grace is a fourth year graduate student in the Department of Sociology at University of Wisconsin-Madison. Her research interests revolve around work quality and health across the life course and the implications for aging. She also geeks out about formal dem demography and mixed methods. All right, thank you all of you. And I'll be sitting right in front of you over there and I'll give you like two and one. Everybody has 13 minutes for their portion and we're all excited. Thank you. So my name is Bert Chanarat, and uh, people describe me already uh, as a, I'm a research scientist at the Center for Anti-Racism Research for Health Equity. So the, uh, the paper that I'm presenting today is one of the chapter of my dissertation, which hope to advance our understanding how work is the determinants of health. So uh, I'm focusing on risk prediction. Why is it not moving on the screen? Oh, okay. Um, so if you're not familiar with risk prediction, why do we need them? So risk prediction is uh, a very important tool that clinicians use to understand the risk profile of their patient so that they can uh, in be informed about what kind of treatment that they, that they recommend for their patients, what kind of prevention that they should direct their patients to. And more importantly, it is something that 
can uh, direct the conversation between patients and provider, making certain people who may have higher risk for developing certain disease, uh, patients will talk about them differently to inform the urgency or many things about that. Uh, so for hypertension, currently there's about 48 uh, equation exists at the time of the study. And with the two that is used the most is by Kershaga, I believe. Kershaga that used the uh, ERIC data to derive and also PERIC, which used the um, Framingham data to, uh, to derive. So what's good? It's very delay in it. <laughs> okay, sorry. Okay, all right. So a uh, good prediction equation have at least three characteristics. So first one is the equation should be able to accurately distinguish between people who will have or have not uh, disease in the future. And we call this measure of discrimination, strangely. And the other, the second characteristic is it's supposed to be able to uh, predict disease for patients at different level of risk. And, the la and lastly, it's supposed to get input information that the patient, that the provider will use to predict risk should be able to collect easily from, or, from electronic medical record or something that can be asked pretty quickly in the quick turnaround of the clinic. So not surprisingly, predictor that's used generally are age, sex, current blood pressure, and uh, body mass index and some other like smoking status and also in many, many cases, race. But uh, the pandemic teaches us one thing that works is actually teaches us many things, but one of the things that we learned that we are embracing is that work is actually directing, like determining how certain people have different kinds of risk. So this is the figure from one of the tables that I cite a lot. So it shows mortality by occupation. So for someone like me, I'm a researcher doing data analysis, screaming at my dog at home. My risk is not that high. Compared to the rest of these people on this slide, which are essential workers, their risk is significantly higher than me. So that shows that occupation actually, occupation and work actually determine the risk level. And it is something that we need to incorporate into how we predict risk for disease. So this is the risk pattern for, for hypertension based on occupational status. The top is a higher occupational status. The lowest one, healthcare aid, that's the lowest uh, status. And generally, these are compose a lot of black women and the risk for black women for COVID and hypertension are the highest. So uh, there's a couple of uh, work related predictor of hypertension that's been studied extensively. So besides um, uh, insecurity and job loss, so the other characters that you study a lot is job demand control support. And it's model that's known to started by uh, Karasek, Johnson and Hall. So there are three, this is generally, you can refer to this as psychosocial work environment. And there are three characteristics. So job demand, which include, I will not read it, but you can read it on this. So job, job demand, job control and support. So for people who have job demand, uh, and high and low job control, those are, for example, you can think of doctors have very high job demand, but low job, but relatively higher job control, their risk for disease is not as high as healthcare aid. For example, they have high job demand, they have high job control and low support. So you may have heard of terms uh, job strain. So job strain is high job demand, low job control, and there's a term called ISO strain, which incorporates support into that. So I talk a lot about work-related characteristic. So the goal of this study is to examine whether if we put work characteristic into a risk prediction, does it improve prediction accuracy or not? And like I mentioned earlier, quick turnaround of the clinic. So we, it is supposed to be, we're trying to use 
measure that are easy to collect or something that can be collected very quickly. So for job loss and job insecurity, we use employment status. And for psychosocial work environment, we derive an occupational measure from the uh, occupational rating data. So uh, for the occupational measure, uh, we use the data from the uh, Occupational Information Network. It is a job rating for like over 200 characteristic for maybe 900 occupations in the US, uh, US economy. And there's a lot of writing about the way to, you can use this. And one thing about ONET is that it's updated very constantly. I think it's four times a year. And the way it's updated is they add more uh, occupation and they don't really update the ratings. Like for example, you will see these days you see YouTuber, but you don't see the change in like the stress for the doctors. So for our measure, we use a pre previous question that people pull from ONET. So this is so three measure job demand control and support. And the highest value for job demand is zero to is four and job control is four and support is two. And I'm not going to read this if you, I think there's a slide already. If you're more, more interested in where I pull the data from, you can look at the slide. So one thing about uh, the measure, the occupational base measure is that it can be linked to any data if your participants uh, occupation was assessed and assigned a code, an, an SOC code, standard occupational code. So for this study, we link that measure to a study called coronary artery risk development in young adult or cardia. And it has four sites and multi-center follow-up studies, as a lot about participant health and background and everything. But one thing that's very, very applicable for this, it's that they ask very, very extensively about occupations and they coded occupational code. So that allows us to link our measure to, to the data and use that to predict risk. So we have about 2000 uh, final, I guess like analytical sample. And this is on the right. These are the var variable that we test whether it helped predict hypertension or not. So bit for this uh, table, the only thing that we don't put in the equation try to test whether it can predict health or not is race. So the way we predict risk is we, so first we define hypertension using the JNC7 definition. So higher than 140 uh, SBP or higher than 90 uh, for a DBP diastolic blood pressure or currently taking hypertension Oh, and also we have another category is uh, pre-hypertension. And the way we uh, derive prediction model is we use statistic regression and use backward selection to kind of narrow down what is the predictor that we should retain in the model. And how we compare the predictive accuracy for different model is we calculate measure of discrimination using uh, C statistic. And generally 0 0.7 is for rule of thumb, it's like good prediction. So the higher, the better. And also measure of calibration, which we use the Hoshmir Lemeshow goodness of fit statistics. So if you look at the table for this, uh, if the value is non-significant, it shows that your model has a good calibration. So we fit the model five different ways. So the first one is that we just let the backward regression select the one that's, select the list of predictor that is significant, that is highly predictive, a predictive of hypertensions. So it's short. So we, so lock BMI, current smoking status, current prehypertension and family history of hypertensions. So, but we want to test whether if we, uh, if you put in occupational characteristic, does that improve accuracy or not? But the model itself, but if you just don't do anything to the selection, occupational characters will get selected out. So in model two, we force in 
the three characteristic of uh, psychosocial work environment and also employment status. And for model three, we also add age and gender. And if you see in the green line, you see that the out of out of the job job demand, job control, and support, the only measure that is significant is job control. So with the effort to try to minimize using a lot of variable, so we test model four. So in this model, we just force in job control only, not the rest. And then for model five, it's similar to model three, but only use job control. So first, the hosmere lemme child p-values is for measure of calibration. You see that all of them are insignificant. So all the model are, are, have a good calibration. So we can just get that out of the way. So the more important thing is the C, st st C statistic. So like I said earlier, it should be at least over 0 0.7. So for all the model, that we derive is 0 0.8 and up. But if you look at model uh, two, three, four, five, those are those are the model that have occupational characteristic in it. It's minimally increased, but it increased. So it shows that it does improve uh, the prediction of our model. So one thing I mentioned a lot about race earlier that we don't put race in our model. And we, in the past few months, I'm sure you have read about the use of race correction term to, and the result of that to basically end up redirecting patients incorrectly, basically based on social construct of race. So we purposely did not do that. Oops, yes. So we purposely just not do that because we think that the the important another important characteristic of risk prediction equation is that it's supposed to be able to predict risk equally well for uh, anybody from different social group, not just like male or female, but like different social group. So the way we do that for this study is so first of all the our sample have not enough, the, the sample size for black and white in our sample are not the same. So in order for us to kind of like rule out sample size effect, so we simulate 200 sets of data set that, what the, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so we simulate 200 uh, data sets and run the C statistic again. So one thing that we found is that our model predict better for white participants com compared to black participants. And one thing that we believe caused this is the fact that we use the occupational, uh, occupational title measure, which is kind of like an average, but doesn't really capture the experience of people in the workplace, like perceived uh, discrimination is not in here. So in the future, if something like this will be use or develop, improve further, uh, there is a potential to include other measure of uh, work-related aspect. People are considering using occupational complexity rather than just job demand control and support, and also live experience. And if you are familiar with uh, job demand control and support world, people generally use um, the job content questionnaire which is very, very extensive and cannot be used in clinical settings. So something to be to consider is shorten that and put it in clinical setting EMR so that doctors can be used, can use it very in the very uh, short time turnaround for that setting. So this study was funded by uh, the Midwest Center for Occupational Health and supported by NIOSH and my co-author are Dr. Pat McGovern, Eva Enns, and Rachel Hartman. If you're more interested in our paper, it's published <laughs> earlier this year in Journal of Human Hypertension. That's all, thank you. So I'm Gracie, it is a pleasure to be here today to talk about my research. 
uh, who you are and how you work, the relationship between employment quality, health, and identity. So as I'm sure everybody in this room would agree, there is a robust literature linking work to health. However, a lot of this literature tends to focus on single characteristics of work, such as decision-making latitude or fringe benefits or income, and the relationship between that variable and health outcomes. Now, while this is important and has helped us articulate the mechanisms and pathways by which work impacts health, it does overlook the fact that work tends to be a multidimensional construct. These characteristics tend to hang together. Within that context, some, oh, yep. Within that context, some studies are starting to take a more typological or holistic approach to work, such as the good jobs, bad jobs framework or the employment quality framework. Remain, they always do. Um, the good jobs, bad jobs framework tends to focus on a dichotomization of job quality and the employment quality framework, while a little bit more um, qualitative in nature, has primarily been limited to the European context or looking at much older Americans in the United States. As such, it's a little bit unclear what a typology of employment quality would look like among workers who entered the labor force in the US after the Great Recession, a period of time which we know dramatically reshaped both opportunities, uh, expectations, and just job characteristics, full stop. And further, while we know that institutionalized racism and sexism impacts not only just what jobs are available to people, but their experiences and treatment within those jobs. It's a little bit less clear whether uh, employment quality has differential returns to health across uh, position in the race and gender hierarchy. So, text, I had three aims with this study. First of all, I wanted to identify a typology of employment quality among workers who had entered the labor force during or directly after the recession. I wanted to assess the relationship, if any, between measures of health and the employment quality types. And finally, I wanted to explore whether that relationship varied when the sample is stratified by both race and gender. My data came from the National Longitudinal Study for Adolescents to Add Health or to Adult Health or Add Health. Uh, the fifth wave in which respondents are about 35 to early 40s, so kind of in getting into the meat of their career. Uh, my sample was restricted to participants who worked 10 hours or more a week, who were not incarcerated or in the military, or who were not missing on key study variables. My outcomes were self-reported health, which I dichotomized into poor or fair versus good, very good or excellent, and a measure of depression using the SESD. My independent variables were racial identity. I looked at white versus non-white, specifically because we know that whiteness is privileged in the US. Gender identity and my typology of employment quality, which I will get to in just a second. And then finally, I did have a number of controls, which I don't have up here, but included things like marital status, children in the home, um, childhood health, education, so on and so forth. So, I chose the employment quality framework to guide my choice of employment quality typology. Broadly speaking, this framework posits that employment quality can be understood along the lines of seven different dimensions, things like employment stability, material rewards, workers' rights, and social protection, which then inform quality sort of along a spectrum rather than just this binary. Often, because these are just uh, dimensions, they have to then be proxied. So uh, most of my variables came from ad health, but I did have to crosswalk over a couple of them from the ONET using respondents' occupational codes. Step in my analysis was to conduct a latent class analysis to identify the typology of work quality. So for anybody that is a little bit less familiar with latent class analysis, this is a it uses observed categorical indicators to separate a population into discrete and exhaustive latent or unobserved classes. Basically, it uses prior research and theory to identify what the researcher believes should hang together and what they think those variables will create. It has a little bit of a qualitative flavor to it. For the purposes of my study, I identified one, two, and three class models. The three class model fit my data the best. These are just general fit statistics 
which I will not bore you with today. After I, I had identified my classes and assigned posterior probabilities of class membership to individuals in my sample, I then conducted a number of multivariate regressions, first in my full sample and then stratified by both race and gender. And of course, all analyses were weighted using the wave five cross-sectional weights. Results from my latent class analysis. I won't get into the item response probabilities too much. I'm happy to talk about them later if you want to. But broadly, my hope is that you, what you take away from the slide is there were these three classes. The first is the carious flexible class, which is characterized by sort of variable working hours, really low probability of fringe benefits, uh, low personal income, but really high probability of decision-making latitude and a fairly high probability of skill promotion. My second class was a stable restrictive class, which was characterized by a more traditional working schedule, 35 to 40 hours a week, high probability of fringe benefits, but a really low probability of um, decision-making latitude and skill promotion. And finally, the high demand, high reward class, which was characterized by the highest probability of the longest working hours, but also the highest probability of high income, uh, fairly high decision-making latitude and, high, and a high probability of fringe benefits. These are just the sample descriptives. Um, I won't talk about these too much, but basically I wanted to show that they, things were fairly well distributed across my sample and subgroups. Results well, from my analyses in the full sample. Uh, probably not, not particularly surprising, the precarious flexible and the stable restrictive classes were associated with lower odds of good health compared to the high demand and high reward class. And they were also associated with slightly higher odds of, or slightly higher um, depression score. Now, what is interesting here, however, is when I changed out the um, comparison class to the stable restrictive class, there was actually no significant difference between the stable restrictive class and the precarious flexible class with regards to either of these health outcomes. It's a little bit more interesting too when we stratify by race and gender. So in this case, we're looking at, again, uh, odds of good health and we see that the stable restrictive class and the precarious flexible class are associated with lower odds of good health for white women, while the stable restrictive class is associated with lower odds of good health for white men, and the precarious flexible class is associated with lower odds of good health for non-white men. However, neither class was associated with a significant difference in odds of health for non-white women, and as you can tell, those confidence intervals are large. Things get even spicier when we look at depression. In this case, class membership is only significantly associated with a change in depression score for white men. And why should we care? To me, there are two big takeaways from this study. First, I hope that it continues to advance the sort of typological and holistic approach to thinking about work and shows how these, these important characteristics interact and hang together to differentially impact health. So for example, my precarious flexible class had a high decision latitude, but low uh, probability of fringe benefits and salary, whereas the stable restrictive class, it's almost the opposite. They had a high probability of fringe benefits, but low decision latitude. And there was no difference between these two classes when it came to any of the outcomes in any of my models. And similarly, the high demand, high reward class had the highest probability of the longest working hours, but was significantly in better shape than the other two classes. Second outcome that I, or the takeaway that I, I hope you take from this study is that um, employment quality cannot be thought of as a one size fits all. When my data were stratified by race and gender, there were very different uh, outcomes for health along those lines, specifically uh, non-white women, class membership was not significantly associated with either health outcome in this study. That could be because of the outcomes I was using. However, we also know that in the US, people who are non-white and non-male experience multiple forms of marginalization. So it's possible that any benefits folks in these 
positions may reap may be undone by other institutional experiences. As such, when we think about job quality and policy, we have to think about these other outside forces that are impacting and shaping them as well. Now, there are, of course, limitations. <laughs> First of all, I do not look at differences between identities on a more granular level. Uh, for example, non-binary persons or differences um, between non-white persons. My employment quality data comes from both subjective and objective sources at Health and the ONET. Um, and it's a little bit spare with regards to the inputs for the employment quality framework. Often dimensions will have multiple proxy variables. And so mine was a little bit, uh, well, spare. So more variables in the future may uncover more employment quality types. And finally, this study is cross-sectional, so it can only speak to one snapshot in time. And it occurred uh, prior to COVID, so um, very different landscape as we know. Uh, now with regards to future directions, I think there's a, a lot of places this can go. Uh, a few that I am hoping to work on, I'm, I'm looking forward to exploring the variation in typology with a broader array of health outcomes, including uh, bio outcomes such as C-reactive protein or allostatic load. I also think it's really important to think about how membership in these typologies changes across time and across adulthood. Uh, Ad Health has a sixth wave of data coming out soon, which should allow for a broader exploration of that. And thinking about how um, occupation of these classes impacts health across, across adulthood as well. And finally, I think it would be really interesting to look at differences in employment quality in the pre and post COVID world, since we know that employment is changing in a really dramatic and interesting way right now. So that is all that I have. Thank you for your time. If you would like to contact me, that's my email down there at the very bottom. And I look forward to your questions. Great, thank you all um, for having me. Um, so today I'll be presenting a paper looking at the association between biological age and occupational characteristics. Um, I'm a postdoc at the University of Southern California, and this paper is joint with Jung Kee Kim, Jennifer Aylshire, and Eileen Kearns. Um, I just want to acknowledge my funding from NIA. Sorry. Okay, um, so I'll just start with some brief background. So as everyone here um, can buy into, work is a social determinant of health that's been associated with numerous age-related diseases as well as mortality. And as we've seen earlier, even looking a bit prior to that, we can see evidence that certain forms of work have been associated with biomarkers indicating early progression of diseases. So for example, hypertension. Um, and also we have this general sense that work is associated with aging faster. So if you've ever seen those photos of a president on his first day in office, followed by him on his last day of office, you see he has gotten a lot more gray hair and everyone sort of accepts, oh yeah, that's because the job is so stressful, it aged him prematurely. Um, and even though we have this sense in our society that jobs can age you, um, it's not really been empirically shown that that is the case. So this article tries to look at that empirically. So let me give you a brief uh, primer here on biological age versus chronological age, which is how we determine whether someone can be said to experience accelerated aging. Um, so at the top here, we have this sort of schematic where each individual is um, has this set of biomarkers we can measure, and everyone has different levels. And these measures will take a population of people of different ages and correlate these biomarkers by age, and then look at how much an individual deviates from what could be considered typical for that age. So say a person is chronologically age 70, but they're uh, levels on these biomarkers indicate that they look more like someone who's 72, for example. We'd say they're experiencing accelerated aging on the order of about two years. And why this is important is because people who can be experiencing accelerated aging have higher risk of these downstream chronic diseases as well as higher mortality. 
And it's intended to measure uh, multiple systems. So it incorporates biomarkers across several uh, systems. And so it's a bit more holistic than just looking at any one at a time. The research questions here are first, whether there's an occupational gradient in accelerated aging. And by this, I mean looking at categories of occupation it, that are ranked according to some form of status or educational attainment required for the job. And then looking at specific working conditions that people hold to see if those are associated with accelerated aging. So what is it about these jobs that makes them bad? So the data here are from the health and retirement study. And we take advantage of the fact that in 2016, the HRS added the Venus blood study, which included numerous biomarkers of aging. And um, because we wanted to look at occupational characteristics held prior to this measure, we looked back at the 2010 wave to ensure that people would be relatively young when we measured their occupational characteristics and ensure that we're not seeing widespread attrition from the labor force quite yet. Um, and so we have all in all about 1800 unique respondents. And so the outcome measure here is expanded biological age. And um, I should mention there are numerous measures of biological age depending on which biomarkers have been available in the studies. Um, but in general, they're taken a set of um, biomarkers available in a study that have been determined by experts to be associated with aging. Um, and in this one, we use expanded biological age, which takes several previous sets and combines them all together to see if that did better than previous iterations. And it has, so um, I'm using that here. And it uses these biomarkers here, which I won't go through, but basically they include um, levels of functioning or dysfunction on either the circulatory system, inflammation, immune functioning, um, and metabolic and organ functioning. So the predictors here, as I mentioned, um, to look at an occupational gradient, we include a categorical measure of occupation where managerial and professional is treated as the highest status or hypothesized lowest risk occupation, followed by sales clerical service and manual. And then we look at three self-reported characteristics in the HRS. Um, these include frequency of heavy lifting. We dichotomize this to be high if someone reports doing this all or almost all the time. Um, the job involving lots of stress, we again dichotomize this to be high if someone strongly agrees. And then last, hours worked per week, and we consider this to be long if they report working 55 or more hours per week. And all of these individual self-reported characteristics have been associated with at least one of the components of expanded biological age. So we do a set of analyses here in which um, the outcome again is expanded biological age. And then all of them include the occupational characteristics. And we begin with just a minimally adjusted model, including chronological age and sex. And so because we include chronological age, we can interpret the coefficient as the deviation from that or the degree of accelerated aging. Um, second, we include race and ethnicity and educational attainment. And the reason we do this is because these two characteristics are strongly associated with selection into jobs. And we wanna make sure that any negative effect we detect from a job is due to the job itself and not due to the fact that people with less education select into a certain job. And then last, we include some factors we think are downstream of the job. So things like earnings and health insurance, as well as certain behaviors that might be um, ways that people deal with the negative aspects of their job. So smoking and alcohol consumption. Uh, so let me walk you through the results. Um, the first set of results look at the occupational gradient. And in our minimally adjusted model, we do see some evidence that all of these categories relative to managerial and professional experience some degree of accelerated aging. It's particularly prominent for service workers who are nearly three years older biologically um, than managerial or professional workers. 
But we see that once we include race and ethnicity and educational attainment, that sales clerical and manual jobs no longer appear to be associated with increased risk, but service work still is. And it's attenuated somewhat, but it remains in our final model. So moving on to the self-reported conditions, um, we see that high stress and heavy lifting are initially associated with accelerated aging. Um, once we include race, ethnicity, and education, this doesn't change. And last, when we include everything, we still see evidence that long working hours and high stress are associated with about 0.8 and one year of accelerated aging, respectively. So the last thing we do is we put these two operationalizations together to see if including the self-reported conditions accounts for the fact that service workers experience this accelerated aging. Um, but we actually don't see that to be the case. It appears that these two different measures of occupation are complementary. So even after including the fact that service work tends to be high stress, um, that doesn't explain why service workers are experiencing accelerated aging. Uh, so to conclude, adverse occupational characteristics are uh, that are held at midlife are associated with accelerated aging. And this is particularly true for stressful work, long working hours, and service work. And I think that this is important because it shows that people in certain types of jobs are systematically reaching older ages in worse health than others. And I think this is important because a lot of our eligibility for things like retirement benefits or um, Medicare eligibility are based on chronological age but not everyone is reaching that chronological age threshold at the same level of health as evidenced by this. Um, and we also find that service work remains associated with accelerated aging, even after including these self-reported conditions. And so in future work, I really wanna look at why it is that service work is so detrimental to health. And I think that the measures here I recognize are not perfect. Um, we think that there's certain stressors associated with service work, like the emotional stress at work or certain aspects of job hours. Like it may not be total hours worked, but it could be the um, irregularity of those hours or having to work specific shifts that are bad for health. And so in the future, I wanna look at ONET data to really drill into what's possible um, to explain why service work is so bad for health. Um, let me acknowledge a few limitations. So the first is that this study is restricted to individuals still working in their 50s. And so this is of concern because we know that even though retirement is traditionally in the 60s, a lot of people start selecting out of the labor force even earlier. And this is particularly the case for people in demanding jobs. And um, I didn't dwell on it, but one interesting finding we saw is that manual work in our full model appeared to be protective or associated with decelerated aging, and we don't actually believe manual work to be good for one's health necessarily. We think it's more that the people who are still employed in manual work at older ages are a select group, and so I think in future work, it would be beneficial to look earlier in the life course before we're starting to see this big movement in and out of jobs. And then last, um, as I mentioned, these occupational characteristics are limited. They're not measuring the constructs that we know to be important. So future work will look at more. Um, and in particular, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that environmental exposures, like exposures to toxins or contaminants at work are detrimental to the components of biological age, but we don't have good data on that. Um, so future work should look at that. Thank you so much, and I look forward to your questions. Right, so um, this is, so I'm also talking about work, but um, I'm gonna be talking actually about housework instead of uh, paid labor. Um, so this is also using the health and retirement study, and this is joint work with my colleague, Kanya Godi, who's on Zoom, um, and uh, my students, Yadira Quintero and Josephine Roberts, who are here with me. All right, so uh, some background. So on average, women live longer than men, but they also tend to experience greater disability at older ages. And the causes of this disability are not always clear. Um, and so 
We know that um, paid work is related to different kinds of health outcomes, but um, here we're considering whether or not housework as a form of unpaid labor that's also done primarily by women in the United States um, might be um, an important consideration. Um, and so we know that even when women work full-time um, in paid labor, they do the vast majority of household work. Um, and the paid and unpaid labor can really generate a lot of stress and strain that lead to negative health outcomes. Um, the other thing about housework is it's not created equal. So female typed housework, and I'll define female and male types more in a minute, um, is considered more burdensome kind of housework where male typed housework is more intermittent. It's generally considered to be more enjoyable. Um, and we know from some prior work that the division of household labor is associated with physiological well being. So there are definitely reasons to think that housework could be related to health outcomes. So in this study, we're assessing whether time spent in female typed, male typed, and total housework is associated with an increased risk of high sensitivity C-reactive protein or high, high levels, um, which is a measure of systemic inflammation. Um, and we're looking at older adults separately for uh, men and women considering heterogeneity by marital status, race, ethnicity, and education. And one of the things that we want to point out is that um, activities that some people may consider to be really mundane, like housework, for example, can really significantly influence health and deserve more attention than they've had um, in a lot of prior literature. All right, so the products we use, as I mentioned, um, the data come from the health and retirement study. Um, our sample is community residing older adults between the ages of 65 and 90. We have about 3,500 females and about 2,600 males. Um, we use a number of different data products um, in order to make the study happen. So we use the RAM longitudinal file. We combine that with the biomarker study, which is where the CRP data comes from, the consumption activity, uh, mail survey, the CAMS, which is collected in odd years, that's where the housework data comes from. Um, the crosswave race and ethnicity file provides us some additional information about the race and ethnicity of respondents. Um, and so we have um, data from 2006 to 2016 from the core and the biomarker study. And then we have data from 2005 to 2015 for the CAMS. And so the housework data is measured in the, the year prior to the measurement of uh, the um, CRP variable. All right, so we include a number of controls. I'll talk more about the setup of the models in a moment. We include age, race, ethnicity, sex as a proxy for gender, um, education, marital status. We do count for the number of children in the household, even though these are older adults. Uh, some of them do have children in the household, although um, it's very minimal number. The natural log of household income, um, we have three different measures of housework, which I'll discuss more in a moment. Um, and then uh, we control for a certain number of mobility and health-related characteristics as well. So we have um, activities of daily living limitations. We have index of fine motor skills and index of large muscles. So all three of those are getting at like mobility problems. Um, and then we have um, heart problems, psychological problems, arthritis, self-rated health, and diabetes. All right, so for the analysis, the dependent variable is high HSCRP. Um, so this is a binary indicator as much of the prior literature has used where high is values that are um, greater than or equal to three milligrams per deciliter to 10 milligrams per deciliter. Um, everything over 10, it's difficult to determine whether or not it's uh, some kind of acute infection or something else. So we, we drop those cases. And then the lower CRP is the people under uh, three milligrams per deciliter. The key independent variables are here. So we have female typed housework, which is a combination of time spent in house cleaning, washing, ironing, and mending, and meal preparation cleanup. We have male typed housework, which is a combination of yard work and gardening, vehicle maintenance and cleaning, and home improvements. And then we have total housework time, which is um, the sum of the two types of housework. 
So we use survey weighted logistic regression models because the HRS is a complex uh, survey uh, sample. Um, age is included as a spline function with five year intervals because um, it does not have a linear relationship with uh, CRP. And we would do separate models by sex as most people do in the housework literature. So we estimate five models. We have a reduced form with just housework and wave. Then we add control variables and then models three, four, and five have interactions. So in model three, we interact housework time with marital status. In model four, we interact with race and ethnicity. And in model five, we interact with education level. All right, so um, briefly, some of the descriptive statistics here, you'll see that on average, uh, the females in the sample are spending about 17 hours a week in female typed housework and about four and a half hours a week in male typed housework. Um, and the males in the sample are spending about eight hours a week in female typed housework and about 10 and a half hours a week in male typed housework. So there's less of a gender gap when you add the total housework together on average than in studies of younger adults, like more middle-aged adults. Um, but we still do uh, see, some, see some differences here. And then if we look at um, the percent with, try that again, high CRP, this is a little small, but about 29% of the females in the sample have high CRP and about 21% of males. So it's fairly common in this sample of older adults. All right, so I'm gonna start first with um, the results for females. We're gonna look first at the results with um, female typed and male typed housework. So models one and two, remember, are just the basic models with no interactions. And we see that male typed housework, more time in male typed housework, so the things like gardening, yard work, home maintenance, um, is associated with lower odds of high uh, CRP. When we start looking at the interactions, we see um, a little bit of variation here. So in model three, we had the interaction with marital status. And we see that more time in male typed housework is linked to lower odds of high um, CRP for individuals identifying as married females. But we see higher odds for those identifying as cohabiting females. So there's a difference by marital status. When we look at race and ethnicity, um, we see that more time in male typed housework is associated with lower odds of high CRP for those individuals who identify as white or European American females, um, but not for other groups. And then if we look at uh, model five, so these were all male typed housework, right? In model five, we actually see female typed housework showing up as important. Um, and what we see is that more time spent in female type housework, so remember that's the stuff like cooking and cleaning, is linked to higher odds of high CRP, which is something we might have expected given that it's sort of the, the more burdensome type of housework um, for those who identify as females who have less than a high school education. So low educated uh, group. So we see some similar things when we look at total housework for women. So more time in total housework is associated with lower odds of high uh, CRP. We see a similar relationship with that marital status um, interaction. We see something a little bit different though with race and ethnicity here. So we still see that more time in housework is uh, linked to lower odds of high CRP for those who identify as white or European American uh, females, but we see greater odds of high CRP um, for those who identify as Black and African American females or as Hispanic females. Um, so we're seeing um, a, an opposite relationship there. And then we see a little bit of a difference as well for uh, Model 5. So in Model 5, we're seeing that more time spent in total housework is linked to lower odds of high CRP for those who identify as female who have either some college or a college degree. For males, we see almost nothing. Um, we see only really that more time spent in male types housework in model five um, is linked to lower odds of high CRP for those individuals who identify as male and have less than a high school education. And we see the opposite, so higher odds for those with at least a college degree. But we're not um, 
super confident in these results because it's the only model that had any statistical significance uh, for males. Okay, so when we look at female housework outcomes, we see greater uh, male typed housework seems to be protective against high CRP, particularly for more advantaged people identifying as female. For example, those um, who are married, those who identify as white or European American, we see greater time in female typed housework only appears to be a risk factor for those who identify as female who have low education, which I think is kind of interesting. And we see the greater total housework time though is a risk factor also for individuals who identify as female and are cohabiting or who identify as black or African American or as Hispanic. For male housework, um, we really see that greater Time in male typed housework may be protective for the lowest education category and a risk factor for the highest education category. But as again, I, as I mentioned, um, it's only the one result that's significant. So we don't want to read too much into that at this point. So we really find limited evidence of a negative effect of female typed housework for high CRP, even though it's considered to be more burdensome and it links with stress in prior literature. One of the reasons we think this could be occurring is because this is a sample of people who are almost entirely retired, which el eliminates a lot of the second shift aspect that comes up in a lot of the prior literature. Um, but that said, like we're still interested in thinking about this a bit further. The stronger effect of a protect, or a stronger evidence for a protective effect of male type housework um, that we see, we're thinking that maybe it's, uh, that, it, that a potential mechanism is that male typed housework has, bears a lot of similarity to physical activity in many ways. Um, and a, a greater time in physical activity is protective against high CRP. One of the things we find though, is that um, time in housework could be a source of poor health for older women from less advantaged backgrounds but potentially protective for those from more advantaged backgrounds, making it a potential source of health disparities among older women that needs uh, more attention. And consistent with the unequal burden of housework in the United States, how, uh, time in housework is more consequential for women's health than for men's health. So there are a few limitations. The measures of HSCRP uh, are not measured at the same time as housework, which has pluses and minuses. We don't have a true measure of self-identified gender and our race ethnicity variable is oversimplified because of sample size. Um, so we're gonna be looking at some additional health outcomes as well, um, including IL-6, which is in the venous blood study that Teresa mentioned um, and osteoporosis. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, America Sanchez and Haley Wise, who contributed research assistance. HRS is sponsored by the National Institute on Aging. Um, we also um, were supported by a grant from the National Institute on Aging ourselves um, and a small grant from uh, the Laverne Academy. Um, you're welcome to follow up with this. Um, and uh, I have references available if anyone uh, wants to ask about that further. Thanks so much.